I wish I used drugs. Something to aspire to. Thanks for listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your host, Big Anklevich. There'll be no more. Ah. And Rish Outfield. But you may feel a little sick. That song is so cool. See what a coodly Faluji. <laughs> Always with you. <laughs> Welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. I'm Rish Outfield. And I'm Big Anglovich. This is episode 100 and what is it? 107. Thanks for joining us once again. What's our story tonight? Today's story is Must Have Own Weapons by Edward... <laughs> by who? You mean McEwen? Oh, uh, yes, that one. Ah. Edward, that guy. <laughs> now, uh, where, where do I know him from? He's he's contributed to the show before. He has. He was the author of one of your favorite stories yet. Final exam? Final exam. Ah. And he also did one of your other favorite stories, Open 24 Hours. Oh, wow. Yeah, check those out, folks, if you're new and you haven't heard them. They're both a treat. Yeah, you can have a good time listening to Rish's cockroach voice. <laughs> Welcome if, to Earthmark. If you check out Open 24 Hours. Uh, okay, well, let's, let's find out a little bit about Edward. And now, a word about the author. Okay, what's going on in Ed McEwen's life right now? It's funny you should ask that, because Ed is offering a series of books for publication. The Robert Feneday Trilogy. The saga of one man's search for his wife's lost starship and his affair with the genetically enhanced assassin Shasti Rainhell. Ah. Shasti Rainhell's own adventures in Hidden Stars and the Morrow series, a tale of Rick Trigart, pilot and Morrow, a 50,000-year-old alien combat android. He's edited the Shah Da anthologies, Tales of the Apocalypse, and Last Call. Presently, he's busy writing for Janet Morris on the upcoming anthologies Layers in Hell and Adventures in Hell. And we'll probably spend more time in hell thereafter. A good long time. In the nonfiction world, he had written extensively on the visual arts. For more, check out Ed's homepage and you can find the link in the show notes. Or... Find him on Facebook. Today's story was produced by Marsha Latham. And special thanks to Julia Hoverson for lending her voice to today's episode. Links in the show notes. Fabulous! Indeed. <laughs> Must Have Own Weapons by Edward McEwen. The ad read, Time Traveler Seeks Active Companion must have own weapons. I've done this before. Call 978-251-6239. On any other day, I'd have done what any sensible person reading the paper would have done. Laugh, shake my head, and move on. But today, sitting in my one-room apartment, surrounded by the debris of my first real relationship, with my rejected engagement ring refracting accusingly at me, was not any other day. Today, I was trying to figure out what I had to live for now that Cynthia had left me for another guy. I took another swig of Jim Beam. On any other day, I hated the taste of hard liquor, but not today. What the hell, I thought, rereading the ad. I had weapons, knew how to use them. Four years with the 82nd Airborne had taught me that. I looked over at the 357 revolver I bought from my job in the convenience store next to Boston University where I was restarting my education. I'd idly speculated on what it would be like to put it to my head and end the pain. There'd been a lot of it in my life. A long trail from childhood to here. It seemed like only more lay ahead. The bottle decided me. It was empty. The hell with it, I said aloud college, the store, and most of all her. Despite my best efforts, I was still too damn sober. Being 25 and fresh out of the airborne made me tougher than the punk college kids at BU, who I could drink under the table. 
Even the punk shoplifting at the store didn't do it when I was there. Army conditioning had been good for something, but right now, it was stopping me from being as utterly hammered as I wanted to be. I picked up the phone and dialed the number. Hello? Said a mature male voice in a British accent. Read your ad, I said. Yes? Who's this? Staff Sergeant Dan Coulter at your service. Well, ex-Staff Sergeant. Are you drunk, sir? Don't call me sir. I work for a living. Sorry, army humor. And yes, I am drunk, though not as much as I would like to be. You getting a lot of calls from sober people for your expedition? Not so much. But I am quite ready to deal with disbelief. I have no need for drunks or fools. Well, I've been a fool lately, I replied. But it was over a woman like it's supposed to be. I'm not an alky. And no, I don't believe you, but I don't care either. I need something to kill time and build distance. You'll do. Ah, young man. But will you? I need an active companion, sharp of wit and quick of hand. What are your qualifications? I was caught between ticked off and amused. The nut job was interviewing me. Well, let's see. I'm 6'2 and 185. I can hit anything I can see with any rifle or pistol made. And I taught unarmed combat in the 82nd. Are you smart? Not about women. No man is. Otherwise? Some college... Good mechanical aptitude, I said. I'm in BU in liberal arts. Oh well, I shall be doing the thinking in any event. I had no quick reply for that. Weapons? He asked. What do you need? I've even got my own body armor. Bring a pistol, rifle, a very good knife or sword if you have it, and your body armor. I'll provide other supplies. You'll need clothes for at least a week's rough travel. Okay. Aren't you going to ask me where and when we're going? I shrugged, although he couldn't see it. No one ever told me before. Just get me out of here. Well? The professor said. I can certainly do that. I'm Professor Basil Chandler. I'll see you at 9 a.m. Oh, no. I awoke at 0600 with a splitting headache and sat up. At the foot of the bed lay my kit and a tightly packed duffel. Another bag held weapons and armor. The task had taken my mind off the empty hours, but now came the morning after. Crap, I thought, as I pulled myself up to sitting. I had a class at 0900 and a long day beyond that with a shift at the Circle K. God, I thought, I can't do this. Can't go through the meaningless motions. Can't face the dreariness of reality. I decided to blow off class. I told Chandler I'd be there, and what the hell? So I threw on boots, field pants and a shirt, and a tack vest over it. <sighs> I humped the kit down to my old Saturn, then grabbed a cup of coffee and an egg biscuit from McShitholes and drove out of Boston. The trip took an hour, during which I told myself ten times what an idiot I was. When I got to the address, I found a rambling brick salt box home, two stories tall with a garret above. It telescoped into a garage and what looked like a workshop in the back. Fencing surrounded the building. The homes nearby had that shut-in, semi-abandoned look of poverty. I reached into my bag and pulled out the holstered 357, putting the rig on under the vest. I left my rifle in the duffel. It was early May and the weather was still crisp. Stone and grit crunched under my boots as I walked up to the door. Before I could knock, it opened. A handsome older woman with red hair and a bun eyed me with a guarded expression. She wore a business suit and looked like a lawyer. You're prompt, Mr. Coulter, she said in a crisp English accent. The professor likes that. Thanks. I'll show you to my brother's study. I followed her into the large building, surprised by how beautifully decorated and lit the inside was. 
Furniture, telescopes, lamps, rugs, and souvenirs from all over the world filled the space. The woman led me back to a room with a walk-in fireplace and heavy leather furniture. On the floor lay a lion-skin rug. The professor will be in to see you in a moment, she said. Would you like some coffee? Sure, thanks. She slipped out of the room and I took the opportunity to look about. The walls held swords, a hunting rifle, even a few Zulu shields. But it was the lion rug that caught my eye. There was something wrong about it. It was not big for an African lion, but the head looked wrong, as did the teeth. When I knelt to get a closer look at the head, I noticed the fangs were over seven inches long. Smilodon populator, said the cultured British voice. One of my little indulgences. I looked up. The gray-haired man at the entrance of the room was about 5'10", slim, and by God, he even wore a tweed jacket and gold-rimmed glasses. He carried in a tray with coffee and mixings and put it down on a campaign table. Also known as? A saber-toothed tiger, I finished. Nice fake. Where did you have it made? I tell people that my students created it for me, Professor Chandler said. Actually, I shot it 73,000 years ago in what will be Brazil. I smiled and stood. So, is this a reality show? Is a guy going to jump out with a camera? The professor smiled. Of course, nothing can be accomplished without proof. Well, you are here, and you seem to fit the bill for an active companion, and, ironically, I am short of time. Let's have a practical demonstration. He reached for a scoped rifle on the wall. I slipped my hand under my vest, the pistol. He spotted the movement. Good, you're armed. A rifle would be better, but we should be only a minute or two. He worked the bolt. Weatherby Grand Safari. One must have the right tools. I normally applaud gun control laws, but it's been deuced inconvenient for my purposes. Yeah, I said, pulling the three fifty seven and holding it down by my side. I've already set everything up for the quickest and easiest of proofs. Follow me. The professor went up to the walk-in fireplace and studied a curious instrument that looked like an astrolabe next to it. An arrow pointed into the fireplace. The professor waved me up, and, feeling like an imbecile, I joined him in the fireplace facing the brick wall. Now, he said, prepare yourself for a shock. I started to laugh as the professor leaned forward. The sky above was a blazing blue, and the air stank of growth and decay. It was hot. I brought up my pistol and swung in a circle. We stood in a vast plain. What? I managed. Then words failed me. Several hundred yards away, dinosaurs walked by. Big, four-legged dinosaurs with long tails balanced behind them. One bellowed like an ox. I could smell their heavy, musky scent. I turned to the professor, my nerves and senses simply numb. He was scratching an arrow in the dirt with his boot. Have to have the exact entry point right, my boy, or God knows where we'll end up. Don't suggest we stay long, but the experience is worth a million words of explanation. I pointed mutely at the beasts, unable to speak. A patasaurus, he said. We're in the late Jurassic, 170 million years ago in Colorado. It's summer. A harsher roar sounded, and the apatosaurs shuffled into a trot. Trot, the professor muttered, as twenty foot of something two-legged and nasty jogged into view. It looked at the apatosaurs. It looked at us. It decided on us. I brought up the pistol. Take two steps straight back, the professor ordered. Now, sergeant. And we stood in the fireplace. I staggered over to the nearby chair and flopped down on it. The professor unloaded his rifle, leaned it against the fireplace, and took off his jacket. His shirt stuck to his ribs. 
Of course, I thought. It had been blazing hot in the Jurassic. When you said time travel, I managed. I thought there would be... A machine I'd tinkered together, like H.G. Wells' Victorian time traveler? No. Man-made time travel may be possible, but the amounts of energy, money, and equipment would doubtless drain the world's economy. This device... He pointed to the Astrolabe affair. ...allows me to control my destination. But that's all. It's only by these rare natural entry points that we can access the Time River. I do not know why they occur, but I and others have learned to detect them. This one had been here for a hundred years, as best I can tell, giving rise to disappearances and legends of haunting. Isn't this dangerous? I demanded. Suppose you... Step on a butterfly and change the future? No, it doesn't work that way. Time is like a mighty river. Its current is irresistible, pushing us forward to where we exit space-time. If you try to alter its course, it resists you. Some think that the Time River is sentient. Perhaps that it is even God. Have you heard of Maurice Bavard? No, I said. Few have, and none know the true story. He was reported to be a young idealist who tried to kill Hitler. Actually, he was a fellow time traveler trying to prevent the Holocaust. But he found that history protects its timeline. He was balked at every turn until eventually he was captured and killed. So if you went back in time to kill your grandfather... Likely the gun would misfire, your train connection would be missed, or he would not be home. Then it's impossible? No, the professor said grimly. But it is very difficult, like damming a great river. But it may be that alternate timelines have flowed forward from some successful attempts. The river has eddies, backflows, and whirlpools. Are there more of you time travelers? Yes, Chandler said as he sat back in his chair. Most are human. Some are not. Some are lost wanderers, not even aware of what has happened to them. Others are brilliant people, some from our future. It was one of these who taught me what I know of time. Before she... Before she was killed. Recent grief has a familiar face. When? I asked. A question with many different answers, Chandler said. But as you mean it, Two months ago, we were investigating the spread of Homo sapiens into Europe. We were supposed to meet in time near a known site of early man, some 53,000 years ago. I found her there, along with the natives. They'd all been shot dead by a high-powered rifle. Shot by who? I don't know, Mr. Coulter. Call me Dan. Well, Dan... I don't know, and that's why I need your help. There's something dangerous going on in the past. I don't know what, and I don't know why, but I need a stout companion to watch my back. I'm prepared to pay you $10,000 for the trip. I'd happily have gone for free, but the 10000 was nice, too. I'm in. Excellent. Professor, why didn't you go back in time farther and warn your friend? A haunted look entered his eyes. That was the first month, he said in a low voice. But the Time River did not permit it. Once I came close enough to see her face, as if through a mist, but... Sorry, I said. He nodded then with a sigh. <sighs> D did you bring any other equipment with you? I went out to the car and brought in my duffels. Despite the bottle and my disbelief, I'd packed well. Life in the 82nd had taught me to pack in my sleep. The only thing I wished for was more ammo. I'd thrown in one box of 357 and 20 rounds of 5110 for my dad's old Winchester lever action. When I returned, I found an impressive breakfast laid out for us. Chandler's sister didn't join us. She merely kissed her brother on the cheek with a whispered, Good luck. And left with a nod to me. Breakfast was consumed in silence. Then we walked back to the study and kitted up. I loaded the rifle, 
The professor had backpacks already made up. I added my clothes and supplies and checked the rig. The professor was obviously an experienced field man. Normally I would take swords or other primitive weapons to defend ourselves, Chandler said. I'm careful about disturbing the Time River unnecessarily and leery of invoking its tendency to protect itself. Woe to us if our guns jammed because the Time River didn't want bullets in the head of a very particular Smilodon destined for the Museum of Natural History. However, we are after an enemy who is not playing by the rules and may be trying to deliberately change the riverbed. I hefted my big bowie, almost a short sword in itself. The professor nodded his approval. He turned to his astrolabe thing and began fiddling. In a few minutes, he was satisfied. Follow me. We emerged from the fireplace into summer on the edge of a densely forested slope. Above, the sky was clouded, but the air was still warm. A shallow stream bubbled and sloshed behind us. The professor cut his return arrow in the sod with an entrenching tool. This is the way back. Fix the details of this place in your mind, in case we become separated. I gathered stones from the riverbed and we filled in the cut arrow. I marked every landmark in my mind. We got maps? I asked, kicking myself for not asking earlier. No, Chandler said with asperity. Nor GPS, nor cell phones, or any other help. Yeah. I guess we should have got the Rand McNally 5300 BC before we left. Chandler didn't answer, but started off at a goodly pace, rifle still on his shoulder. I levered around into the 5110 and walked trail, three meters behind. An hour's walk brought us to a small valley and the scene of tragedy. Six human skeletons decorated the landscape. The bodies had been scattered and torn up by small scavengers. Chandler walked past the bones to a mound of stones. He paused and gathered some nearby wildflowers to place on the cairn, adjusting some rocks that a curious scavenger must have moved. Fortunately, it must have found easier pickings elsewhere. I hung back as the professor sat by the cairn for five minutes. It gave me a chance to examine the bones. I wasn't a paleontologist, but I had seen such sights in Africa and the Mideast. Four men and two women, I guessed. If there had been children, they'd gotten away. Though what chance they had without their family, I didn't know. Two skulls showed bullet holes. The killer was either good, lucky, or both. I looked up from my dismal research as Chandler walked up, his face gray and grim. Her name was Satara, he said. Satara, I said, knowing that it was important to remember. Suddenly, the situation with Cynthia seemed so trivial, so damn silly that I was ashamed of myself. Beautiful name. Yes. He stared at the ground. What do you say we get to the top of that hill there? I pointed with my rifle. It commands a view of the area. Maybe we'll see something. Excellent idea. Another hour saw us atop the hill and above the skirt of trees and bushes that encircled it. I had to admit that the real estate was beautiful. Where are we? A broad, shallow valley, rather like your Shenandoah, in what will be southern France. Homo sapiens used this as a highway into Europe, into the land of the Neanderthal. I pulled out a set of field glasses and scanned the vast valley below. I saw the glint of another river and figured if there was anyone around, they'd be near water. Ah, I said, smoke. Somebody has a small fire going down by the river near where it forks. Chandler nodded. Worth checking. I took a compass reading and noted it in the crude map book I was making. Chandler might be happy to go by dead reckoning, but I wasn't. This time I let off, and Chandler unlimbered his rifle. We walked in silence, staying under cover and by late afternoon we reached the campsite. We could have saved the precautions. Another family group of shaggy humans lay scattered about a well-established campsite of rough lean-tos and fire pits. One of these trailed the thin rill of smoke we had seen. Chandler and I huddled behind a boulder near the riverbed. Those bodies are fresh, I said. The fire's still going. This had to have just happened. We scanned the area with field glasses and scope, but saw nothing. 
cover me, I said. I jogged out of cover, rifle up, and zigzagged into the camp. Nothing. I waved Chandler up. The stink of blood hung in the air. Something dog-like was worrying one body on the stream side. Chandler cursed and raised his rifle. Bollocks. No, I snapped. Don't give away our location. The critter heard us and bolted. We turned our attention to the campsite. There were twelve dead, and this time two children were among them. All had been shot. They were small, dirty, covered with tattoos and wearing skins, and probably hadn't smelled so good when alive. But the kids looked like kids, and the adults' faces, if shaved or made up, wouldn't have attracted a second glance on any street. I climbed atop a boulder to survey the pattern of the slaughter. What are you seeing? Chandler demanded. From the way everyone was cut down, the bad guys were over there. I gestured to the other side of a shallow tributary. I'm thinking, because they weren't all cut down together, that there were only a few bad guys, or they have slow-firing weapons. Those in the center tried to rally, then people tried to run. Chandler looked up the lowering clouds and westering sun. Too late to stop tracking them. Maybe we can pull the bad guys back, I said. What? The shooters can't have gone far, and their objective seems to be wiping out the people in this area. If they thought they missed someone, they might come back. With the sun sinking, Chandler threw wood and wet leaves in the fire to generate smoke. Then we moved most of the bodies into the lean-tos. I did the unpleasant task of propping up three dead men by the fire, bending the stiff limbs as best I could, and putting spears on their shoulders. I was glad I'd packed gloves. Hopefully the shooters would think that a late hunting party had returned and sat grieving in the camp. We heated up some food and took it with us as we retreated into the woods opposite where I'd guessed the shooters would return. Chandler looked at his food without interest. Chow down, Professor. We got a long, cold night, and if things go well, we'll be killing somebody. You'll need your strength. Chandler nodded and forced himself to eat. I felt queasy too, but I'd been in ambushes before. Hours passed, and it grew cold. A hunter's moon rose and contributed to the growing feeling of unreality I struggled with. Was I actually back 50,000 years in a European forest listening to the yowls of God knew what in the hills? A gun stuttered out a short burst, yanking me back into focus. The three dead hunters were knocked over by the impacts. A rifle snapped up to cover the spot where the weapon had flashed. Hold your fire, I whispered. It's one shooter. Let's see if he comes into the light. The burst of fire had silenced all the forest creatures. Bugs started up first. The river gurgled and sloshed, and the fire crackled. We waited. He stepped out, and between the firelight and the moon we saw him clearly. Brow ridges, broad nose, sloped skull, barrel rib case. Neanderthal, Chandler whispered. The creature moving down the draw was a Neanderthal but not from our timeline. He moved over the rocks with an easy, muscular stride. No clumsy caveman here. The weapon he held under one arm was unfamiliar, but had the nasty look of an assault rifle with a long magazine. He wore a fine-looking safari suit, with what looked like a pith helmet. The beard was trim, and he practically bounced with the energy of a powerful and athletic body. He moved warily toward the bodies. I nodded at Chandler, and we sighted in. Our rifles cracked together, but whether we'd made some sound or he caught a light off one of our weapons, or he just got lucky, the Neanderthal jumped. My round tore the helmet off his head, snapping away half the brim. Chandler missed clean. The Neanderthal rolled up flat and opened up with a long burst from his military-style weapon, firing at our flashes. We ducked as wood and leaves rained down on us. Then we returned fire. His weapon had the greater rate of fire, but there were two of us, and he was in the open. Our shots threw up dirt around him and brought down a lean-to. He sprayed more rounds at us. Splinters nicked my face and I ducked. 
The Neanderthal took advantage of suppressing us to kick a load of sandy soil into the fire, which guttered. Then he raced for the woods faster than I would have imagined possible. My rifle clicked empty. I whipped out the pistol and cracked off two rounds, hoping for a lucky hit. If I hit him, it didn't slow him. Then he disappeared into the dark embrace of the forest. God damn it! Chandler shouted. Shut up! I hissed, reloading frantically. Follow me! We shifted from our known position, heading for where we'd cached our supplies. The Neanderthal might have friends, or he might be hunting us now. I doubted both, but guessing wrong was fatal. We reached our equipment and climbed out onto a rocky promontory nearby. It would be near impossible to sneak up on us now. I scanned with my field glasses for a few minutes before turning to Chandler. Who was that? I demanded, keeping my voice low. I know a little more than you do. He looks like a Neanderthal, but obviously he's no primitive. I wonder. Chandler was silent for a few minutes, and the moon reflected off his gold-rimmed glasses. Of course, he said. Remember that I told you how the river of time has eddies and backflows. Yeah? I have heard that the time river sometimes overflows, like when the Nile floods and creates smaller, temporary rivers that run into the desert before being absorbed. He must be from one such where Neanderthal survived, a freak fragment of time destined to dissolve in entropy. Only he won't go quietly into that good night. He's trying to burrow back to the main river, running through time, killing the early Homo sapiens that moved into Europe. Surely he can't get them all. He can use time effectively, Chandler said. And he is determined. Maybe he will recruit others. The population of Homo sapiens is tiny now, and few came to Europe. He need only tip the scale a small amount to keep his kind alive until some pivotal event for his own timeline gives them the advantage that allowed them to survive there. Then we have to kill him. Yes, for our species, for the people in the village below us, and for Satara. The night was cold, and we slept badly in shifts. As the sun brightened in the east, we headed back circling the camp in case the Neander was waiting on us. We dashed across the river simultaneously but drew no fire. His trail was easily spotted from where he'd crashed through the underbrush. A few hundred yards in, the Neander must have realized he couldn't continue in the dark. With us hunting him, he didn't dare show a light, so we'd huddled up and had a meal. We found packets of dried food that looked like ours only the writing on them was like no script even the professor had ever seen. He must have moved out at first light, I said. The question is, where? Chandler's mouth drew into a grim line. We gave him a terrible shock. My bet is that he is heading for home. No indication that we hit him. No blood trail, I said. But they're easy to miss. It's been hours. Then we will have to move very rapidly to overtake him. Now it was my turn to frown. Close pursuit of a fleeing enemy was dangerous. But I couldn't get the faces of the dead kids off my mind. Drop the packs. Weapons only. The Neander hadn't done a very good job of hiding his trail, and I'd hunted deer in Ohio and men in Africa and Afghanistan. Freed of our equipment, we made good time for all of the roughness of the hills, We munched power bars and sipped from our canteens as we hoofed it. Hours later, we left the shade of the forest into a glacial moraine with boulders ranging from the size of cars to small buildings, half buried in the sod. Look, Chandler said, pointing. Ahead, in a tumble of huge white stones, was a place of torn up soil and two markers in the shape of stone arrows, much like the one we had left at our entry point. Before I could stop him, the professor jogged up. Damn, he's escaped back into his own time. We've lost. Maybe not, I said. Will he dare come back not knowing if we're waiting for him on this side? Damn. Chandler swore again, shaking his rifle in frustration. It saved his life as the flung stone struck his weapon before knocking the professor over like a bowling pin. 
I spun and fired at the charging Neanderthal as he sprang from behind a massive boulder. My shot missed, and before I could lever in another round, he flung his empty rifle at me. I blocked with mine, but he hit me like a Green Bay lineman. My rifle went one way and I the other. The Neander fell over me, but scrambled up, pulling out a machete of ugly black metal as I clawed for my pistol. He swung, and the blade thudded home, forcing a cry from me. But the body armor beneath my jacket stopped the machete from penetrating. Behind the Neander, Chandler recovered enough to scramble toward his weapon. The Neander must have thought he'd finished me, because he leapt at Chandler. As he raised the machete, I pulled my 357 and fired. Two shots took him in the back. He slewed about and flung the machete as I emptied the rest of the cylinder at him. The machete clipped my shoulder, again cutting through my jacket, and this time drawing blood, grazing my arm. The last shots did it, and the Neander groaned and sank to his knees, then fell on his back. <laughs> Chandler and I recovered our rifles and stood over the downed Neanderthal. He looked up at us with glazed eyes. In the clear light of day, his face was even more striking, with the heavy brows, broad nose and lips. Neatly trimmed hair covered most of the face. I noted a bandage on his right leg. I'd hit him last night, after all. You win, he said in a gravelly voice. You speak our language, Chandler said, in obvious surprise. <coughs> Several, he coughed. I studied your kind will. Why? Chandler asked, tight-lipped. Why all this? Surely you guessed. I'm from a distributary to the Time River. I learned that my people were doomed unless the main Time River could be altered. At first I tried to advance them, give them weapons, leadership, technological advances. But I failed. Either the Time River resisted me, or it was some inherent weakness in my people. So I had to resort to destroying yours. Gods forgive me. But the Time River has ordained that your kind will inherit the future. <coughs> He coughed again, and bright blood speckled his lips. How come you didn't jump out? I gestured at the rock arrows. The Neander shook his head. Couldn't let you find the real entry to my time. It's far from here. Afraid we'd do to you what you tried to do to us. Yes. I slapped a bandage on my cut arm and looked at Chandler. He shook his head. I knew we could do nothing for the Neander, and marveled he'd lasted this long. May the condemned ask a final wish? The Neanderthal asked. Chandler looked down at him. Ask. I'm not sorry to die. I always intended to kill myself to atone for my murders. Bury me among my own kind. He gestured with a weak hand. By the leaning rocks is a cave my people lived in before fleeing yours. Their dead are within. I failed them, but perhaps my soul can find rest with theirs. Chandler looked at me, and I nodded. We'll do it, he said. Then, to my surprise, what was your name? Ula, he said, voice fading. I was a teacher at university. Ah, that I had never left. <laughs> a shudder racked the powerful body, and animation faded from the eyes. He sank into the ground in the shapeless relaxation of the dead. We dragged the heavy body up to the cave. Neither of us had the heart to strip him of his modern clothes. But we took all of his equipment and trusted that the clothes would rot off. A covering of stones hid the body from view, 
and we started the long, weary trek back to our own entry point. This time, when we slipped into the future through the fireplace, I hardly marveled at the change. We dropped our packs, and the professor fetched two Cokes from the kitchen. The sugar and caffeine brought me back to life, and I noted the clock on the wall. Chandler followed my eyes. We use time only in the past. Today we have been gone only a few minutes. He rose from the chair and walked over to a closet. Inside was a wall safe. Chandler opened it, extracting an envelope which he handed to me. For your services and your silence, and with my thanks. I think I'll head home for a long bath and a good meal, I said. Mostly I wanted to be alone to think. The world had changed for me. Sound plan. Chandler helped me with my duffels. Then we stood facing each other in the doorway. Makes you wonder, I said. Did we have free will in this? Or were we just the Time River's agents? Was the past really ever in danger? I don't know, Chandler said. That question has faced man since he first became sentient. All we can do is act and hope our actions are right and proper. I stuck out my hand and Chandler shook it. Will we meet again, Professor? Chandler looked at me over his glasses. I'm sure we will, young man. I'm sure we will. In time. The door slid smoothly closed. Author's Note The story of this one originates with my favorite radio series, Car Talk, on NPR with Tom and Ray Magliozzi. At the beginning of the show, Tom was reading from personal ads in the Boston paper and came up with this one. Time Traveler Seeks Adventurous Companion Must Have Own Weapons. I've done this before. That expression kept running around in my head. Must have own weapons. I thought, what the heck? Say I was asked to participate in an adventure and all I could use was stuff I had around the house. And, okay, as a martial arts instructor and an expert shot, my house might be just a tiny bit better equipped than the average for that sort of thing. I put together my time traveler's kit of weapons and gear and then thought that it was kind of a shame that I wasn't off on some adventure. But being a writer gives you an option there. I came up with the story of a young man just out of the military and a bad relationship and fed up with his crappy job. In short, in the emotional state to do something, particularly with the aid of cheap booze. Completely wacky. So he answers the ad and gets more than he ever expected. It all goes to show you that you just never know where the next bit of inspiration is coming from. Now I have to go. It's time to feed the Velociraptor. Kind regards, Ed. And we're back! Woo! Thank you for listening and stuff. Coming along with us and bringing your own weapons. Yes, that's a must. Hey, we just listened to the story as well. And so uh, I want to thank Marshall for doing a bang-up job. In fact, if there's a level above bang up, that's what kind of job Marshall did. Kick ass. Hey, you All right. That sounds <laughs> fair. Marshall has produced for us before, and uh, I believe this is the last time he'll be doing that for a while, right? Actually, I connived and convinced him into doing at least one more for us. Oh, okay. Because the reason I mention it is that Marshall is, is going off on his own. He no longer needs mommy and daddy. <laughs> and, and he's starting his own podcast. That's right. It, the, well, the podcast is called Journey Into... How many O's are in into... There's actually uh... just one O, but there's three dots after oh, it. Okay. It's an ellipse. So yeah, it's journey into whatever, you know, space or mystery or science or whatever, I guess is his idea behind that title. Okay. Um, but yeah, anyways, I was just looking at it. He's, he's already made it to episode three. By the time this episode comes out, he's probably going to be at episode 10. Are we that far behind, sir? <laughs> but uh, yeah, he, he does all sorts of different stuff, I guess, with the show. It's a little different than ours. He throws on old radio dramas sometimes and he throws on stories that he produces kind of like we do 
or he throws on just little flash fiction stories. If you're into that kind of stuff, I mean, you get stories like our show, but you also get some other interesting radio drama stuff and things like that to check out. Plus, doesn't he do old uh, public domain stories? I think so, yeah, like Edgar Allan Poe and, and, and stuff like that. I did lines for an Edgar Allan Poe story for him, so it oh, cool. is to come. I believe you did lines for a Tim Pratt story to come on his show, Ryan? I have no memory of that. <laughs> well, you did, because I remember it. Okay. Hey, can we get the URL for this uh, podcast of his? Yeah, it, it's journeyintopodcast.blogspot.com, and we'll be sure to put a, a link to it in the show notes. Hey, uh, Marshall, if you've got a promo, give it to us, and we'll run it in a future episode. That's right. So we just listened to it, and uh, I was really impressed by the sound design. Yeah, he did an amazing job. I think the last story he did for us was the one about the dragon. The dragon that wasn't. The dragon that wasn't, yes. What was that called? I've forgotten. The, the, the Alcarm. Yes, The Alarm by Harris Tobias, right? I believe it was Tobias Harris. <laughs> That story was a simpler story, I think, than this one. It was much shorter and uh, more easy to handle as far as that goes. But you can see an immense amount of progress. It's like this guy's gone from second grade to third grade already here in, in the one story or whatever good analogy to that is. Impressive, I thought. There was a lot of really cool moments that had nothing to do with the story. They were just cool moments of sound things that Marshall put into this. That uh, I really enjoyed. I loved the sound effect he had for when they traveled. It sounded like something burned real quickly. Like there's a little piece of paper and it went whoosh, burned real fast or something like that. You know what I did the other day? I was supposed to be starting the barbecue. And our, our barbecue is a little finicky. And sometimes if you don't have the hose in just the right way, the um, propane doesn't come out. So I was down messing with the propane tank trying to get some propane to come out. And I noticed there was a dandelion right by our barbecue gone white it was the poof ball dandelion not the flower itself and since i was sitting there right next to it with a lighter in my hand i thought huh and so i turned the lighter on and stuck it on the dandelion that thing went up poof. i had no idea that a dandelion would do that but it was cool just like the sound effect sorry that's why i and, went off on and, that. and you look great with no eyebrows <laughs> thank you I especially liked when the music came in, when the Neanderthal was dying. Have we credited who the music was? Do we know where that music came from? It looks like he had four different musical artists. I mean, five if you count Sting and Stuart and Andy. <laughs> and yeah, it was just really interesting the way he layered the music and, and had the, the little bongo drums for the interstitial music. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I haven't edited enough episodes where I do the music to get a real feel for it. If it were up to me, every story I edit would have uh, Roger Subarana, the uh, same yes. Roger Subarana music. And there are some podcasts that do that. <laughs> right. But, right. you know, luckily uh, but, you're willing to go that extra mile and do the music for me like the one we did a couple weeks ago. The podcasts that do do that are the ones that you complain about more than others, though. So there is that. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I, I don't think I would complain if they used Roger well, Super Well, that, that might be true. But uh, yeah, that was some really good stuff. I was really impressed by Marshall's production on this story. And, I, uh, you know, I really enjoyed the story itself, too. Uh, this was another one of uh, a particular favorite of yours, wasn't it? When you read this story, what was your reaction to it? Oh, uh, yeah, I just couldn't wait to do it. It was another one of those that felt like it had been made for us. Mm -hmm. I had forgotten that there was a female character in there very, very briefly. And I was like, oh, Big and I can do this together. And it'll be just him and me. And we'll get a Parsec nomination for it because <laughs> they have this rule where you can have two or fewer voices or three or infinite number of voices. And it's really hard to have the, the line in the sand of two voices. Right. And I thought, oh, this one we'll actually be able to pull off. And Turns out two and a third. Yeah, one a extra ones. voice in there. So the no parsec for you. Of course, that was going to happen anyways. <laughs> well, I hear you, and and it's not that huge a deal the the parsecs. But while I'm talking about it, they've got fiction. What, what they have short stories and audio drama. 
right? Right. They don't have what we do, which is full cast audio readings mm -hmm. in there. And so when it came time to submit something for the Parsecs, we just had to go for audio drama. And it would be nice if they had a category for full cast audio. And I can understand them not. Because I never heard the word full cast <laughs> until probably until Brian started his podcast. Uh -huh. We just read stories aloud and assigned all the parts out to different people or many parts to me in whichever case. And <laughs> we didn't know what the name was for it. But who knows, maybe in 2012, if we're all still around, they will have a third category that has what we do. Right. Yeah. I think the, the, the problem that they had with it at the Parsecs is just you have to come up with an exact definition so that you can say this is full cast, this isn't. This is just story reading, this is audio drama, and they can sort them all to make sure that things get into the right category. And that's why they did the two voices versus three voices or more, is so that they could sort. This is story reading, this is audio drama. And uh, they just kind of use that as a general way to do it. But it, unfortunate because what we do isn't really audio drama. Right. And, and if we got a parsec, somebody somewhere would make a stink about that. They're like, oh, they have a narrator. They read yeah. a story. That's not real art. Yeah, and rightly so. They could, what? well, it's not, it's not actually audio drama what we do. And so it does make it difficult. But we'll see. Maybe we convinced them. I did mention that to them Good. Uh, the last time. And, uh, they said, I think they hadn't heard the term full cast before either, at least the person I was talking with. So uh, who knows what will happen in 2012. Our podcast will be long dead by then, but maybe they'll have a full cast category. And luckily, so will I. <laughs> the, so back to the story. The story uh, was one of those where as soon as, I don't know that it was one of those that I wanted from the first page, but it was one of those as soon as I knew that it was about time travel and Isn't the ad from the professor the first paragraph of the story? Right, and he right, says, but, time traveler wants companion. Yes, but it could have been comedic <laughs> and it could have been a crackpot or it could okay. have been you know, something else. Once, I, uh, once they once went it was back confirmed. and there was actual time travel and we found out that there was more than just, you know, let's go out and have an adventure going on. I really loved it. The, the whole time river and preventing the Neanderthal from eliminating the Homo sapiens, that was just, I almost said rad. Oh, shoot, I did say. Oh, crap. Give away. Uh, it was great. It was now people great. know how old you are. Yeah, it's really said radical all the time. Sometimes we said bad, but bad meant good. Yes. <laughs> I, yeah, Same I, as rad. <laughs> Sorry, go on. I don't know. How, how about you? Did, was this one of those that had it been up to you, you wouldn't have accepted? Oh, no, I would have. Um, I could tell right away that it was going to be, well, I don't know, maybe I was like you, two pages in. I could tell that it was one of those that we should probably do, and that's one of the reasons why I forwarded it on to you. We're both, I think, suckers for time travel stories. As long as they're interesting, you know, we're all over it. So there's a uh, clue for anybody who's submitting Although those people that submit tend to not be listeners. Well, just for a second, let's all do the bump. You, sir, are worse than Hitler. When somebody submits a story, we have several readers that read our slush. Mm -hmm. And if you impress them, I believe they send their good marks to Sudden Death Nicole, who is our submissions editor. Mm -hmm. And then she will forward on the stories that pass her test, I guess you could say. Mm -hmm. And usually she'll send us a little paragraph attached to the story of this is what I thought of the story, or this is what our people thought of the story, or the Oompa Loompas are complaining again. And uh, so we will read the story. And lots of times I'll skip her paragraph because it tends to be like, oh, you know, the ending comes out of nowhere and it's just going to floor you when the child starves to death. And I'm like, ah! <laughs> so she'll, she'll send that to us. And a lot of times you'll print it out and give it to me. Then we'll send her our yeas or our nays. And so if you've sent in stories that have been rejected, uh, sometimes it's just the luck of the draw, which Oompa Loompa you happen to get, whether Nicole feels like it's a Doonstief story. I mean, usually we ask that it have enough parts that both of us can participate in the mm -hmm. story. And I know there have been some stories that haven't made it to the air because it was, you know, first person female with no other characters kind of thing like that. But it's difficult to say what is a Dunstief story. I know we talked about that recently. 
And yeah, this one just, it felt right. It felt like, oh, I want to do this. What, mm -hmm. yeah. there, there was adventure and there was also a little bit of pathos there. And there was a guy with an accent and then a Neanderthal accent. What is that kind of thing? So, <laughs> so I'm very glad that Edward sent us the story and uh, that we had a chance to do it and uh, that Marshall did such a great job. Yeah, that uh, really made it work, uh, the stuff that he put into that. Now this, I don't know that I've even actually ever seen an episode of this show. Mm -hmm. I know where you're going, by the way. This story is reminiscent of the TV show Doctor Who, right? Yes, it is. And I certainly was thinking of a particular doctor when I first read it aloud. And uh, I believe Edward told me to do it differently. And I think I did it somewhere in between. But yes, the, the, the doctor is sort of a, an immortal alien you know, thousands of years old, that goes on adventures through time, and he always has a human companion with him. Mm -hmm. um, the human companion is just somebody that he can bring along for the ride, for the adventure, uh, just because he's a social being. And spoiler alert, his people are all gone, and he likes to have somebody to show. It's kind of like going on a vacation, you know, looking at the sunset or whatever. It's not the same if you don't have somebody to look over at and say, wow, look at that. Wow, pretty, that's huh? really pretty. And so that's what the doctor is, uh, except for that there's monsters in every single episode. And for some reason, they're always really, really terrifying. Uh, when I first started watching the show, I would be like, why would they make monsters this scary for a show that's for kids? And then I had an argument with somebody about whether it was for kids or not. And, but I can guarantee you, the monsters are always way too scary for kids if the show is a kid's show. Okay. Anyhow, I, I'm a recent convert to Doctor Who. Big oh, fan. And, okay. and it, it's a fantastic show. And yeah, there, there was a little bit of sense of that, especially because he had the English accent. I don't think... He was professor -y. Right. With a tweed jacket. Uh, yes, he, and gold rim glasses. Too. Yes. He's a doctor after on all. The, Depends on the incarnation of the doctor. Uh, now, how does that work? I'm just curious because I'm I'm not a convert to the show yet, so I'd I like haven't seen it. I'd like it. you to be. There's a Vincent Van Gogh episode that I need you to see because it's just yeah. it's awesome. Basically, how does this, the very first doctor did it for a couple of years, and then he didn't want to do the show anymore, and they came up with the conceit of if the doctor is fatally injured that his species has the ability to regenerate, in which the old doctor dies and a new doctor, he is reborn in a new form. And that was their way of saying, okay, this is a new actor that's going to be taking over the role. And they've done that ever since. You know, a doctor signs on, and when he doesn't want to do the show anymore, they have a way of killing him off. And then the new actor takes over, and the new actor has different mannerisms, maybe dresses differently, talks differently. Where's the tweed jacket? Yeah, he well may. <laughs> it's it's been very very smart the way that they've done that, and uh, I believe right now we're on the tenth Doctor. Hmm, interesting. So, how is it that Doctor Who always has at least three of the five nominations for best narrative short form on the Hugo's every year? It's just that good. Oh. Also, it's a it's a geek centric show. I, I think if if Star Trek: The Next Generation were still on in its later seasons, they might give it a run for its money because that was a very geek centric show with really mm -hmm. good writing as well. Doctor Who, like all, almost all British shows, has a very truncated season. Usually, it's like twelve episodes. Oh yeah, for the whole year, and so they are able to put in you know all of their effort on these 12 episodes uh, and you don't really get the throwaway episodes that happens inevitably when you have to have 22 or 25 like you got on Battlestar Galactica and yeah, you, Battlestar Galactica I doubt they ever had 22 episodes in a season I don't but. think they probably did but they did have several throwaway episodes like let me think Black Market oh. comes to mind yeah I remember we oh, watched one that of the worst it. ever I don't know how that works but they get really good writers and uh, that's the thing about television is they always give the writer a, a lot of power, a lot of influence. The directors are just workmen for hire, mm -hmm. unlike the movies where writers are spat upon. Uh -huh. Shat upon, actually. Very possible. I don't know. It's, it's just a very well-written show. It's uh, to, to, What else is nominated? This year? No, I don't care because you're going to have to say, fuck me, Ray Bradbury, and I don't want that. <laughs> I know all that. Uh, we've had other time travel stories on the show, right? We've traveled through time many, 
times, actually. Yeah, let's see how many we can come up with. There was This Must Be the Place. Oh, okay. That's one. That's the Cory Doctorow story? No. Oh, A Place So Foreign is the Cory A Doctorow. Place So Foreign is another time travel story. This Must Be the Place was the 1984 where the guy travels back in time at the end of every 84 and lives it again in another city. Elliot Bangs. Your mom. Um, let's see. Spider bunt. Spider bunt. Spider bunt. Spider bunt. Oh, you know one that I think we could say is time travel is that one story lost in memory. I don't know if you remember that one, but the guy would like see a picture and he would remember like the time when he and his friends were making trouble. Yeah, they like lit a pentacle of fire in his backyard while rocking out to Motley Crue or something like that. And then he would come back to and his like eyebrows were burned off or something Just like, like that. yours. Yeah. Yeah, I, I bet you can't remember who wrote Lost in Memory. I can because he used his actual name for the character. Oh, that's right. <laughs> his name was Mr. Kluchar. <laughs> I assume that's how you say it. I don't know. We said it that way anyways. It's probably his name actually, probably cliche or something. I don't know, but yeah. That's too cliched. <laughs> That one was probably counted as a time travel story. I don't know. I'm sure we've done others too, but maybe we haven't. I don't know. I would have thought that we had more, but that's all I can come up with is yeah, those three. Yeah, remind us if there are more. I'd love to do more time travel stories. As you know, it's one of my favorite subgenres. And I don't know, maybe we could uh, ask for time travel stories the way that we asked for space opera. No? Sure. Send a time travel stories. I think that's going to work. I don't know. Marine. One can only hope. We've talked a lot about time travel on the show before, just because it's something that we both dig. I don't know if there's a point in mentioning it again. Probably not. We could talk about Neanderthal accents. <laughs> we could. It's more stories. Send in more stories with Neanderthal voice parts. Speaking of more stories with Neanderthals, or not speaking of that, depending on whether we cut that part out or not, what did you do to come up with your Neanderthal voice? It sounded almost like it had a hint of maybe a Russian accent to it or something like that. Did you just kind of try and say all the words strangely? You just Did you have a plan behind it or did you just kind of go and hope it sounded funky or what was your deal with the uh, Neanderthal accent? I wish there was a cool story about that, you know. You know, if you, if you wanted to put in as much work as Marshall did in the editing... You could come up with how each word is going to sound in a dialect and that, but uh, it was just whatever I came up with at the time. I'm sure I couldn't duplicate it exactly uh -huh. if I had to. Kind of off the cuff. But yeah, I, I heard some weird, like almost Scottish in there as well when we were listening to it. And I couldn't listen too carefully because uh, just the same as the doctor's voice, I had to... Sorry, the professor's voice. I had to uh, <laughs> take a step back and... Professor what? I become too critical, self-critical of my performances. And that's an advantage that everybody else has, I would imagine, over me, is that the story is new to them or they can just let the story take them away. Although, if I pronounce patronize, patronize in an English accent, maybe that would take somebody out of the story too. Because they're just like, hey, hey, Brits don't say patronize. Yeah. And so I I don't know. I, I'm too close to the parts that I do. I don't know. We could have had somebody else do the Neanderthal. I just thought it would be fun to try. Yeah. I mean, made up accent. I think that was one of the main things that you were after when we were doing this story was the chance to try and come up with the uh, Neanderthal accent. I'm sure you would have stomped your foot and said, no, the line must be drawn here if uh, we tried to do it some other way. So was going that way and that's the way it went but uh, yeah it is interesting you know to try and make up an accent it's it, it's hard because it's always going to sound like something else a little bit at least here and there because it has to yeah i don't know how you can make up a completely new original fake sounding accent or non-fake sounding accent, I guess, is probably a better way well, to put it. I'm sure people have done it. I, I, like, whatever Bronson Pinchot did on Perfect Strangers, <laughs> I don't think that was a real accent. Uh -huh. uh, I remember Martin Short had some outrageous crap accent in the Father of the Bride movies. Mm -hmm. and but those resemble a type of accent, you know? Like, Bronson Pinchot's accent wasn't a real accent. 
but everybody just assumed it was some sort of Eastern European thing that he had going on because it kind of resembled that. Although it was outlandish and crazy, it still sounded like something. Did you watch that show? Oh, I watched it so religiously, which is pretty sad well, you, when you look back on it. Did you ever laugh when he said, Don't be ridiculous? Because um, the audience would go crazy every time. Well, that's and, what you had to do in 80s and 70s sitcoms. You well, had to have your I little... I think by the 80s that was done, wasn't it? No, dude. Half of Different Strokes was filmed in the 80s. Oh, all right. And he said, what you talking about to somebody every single show and they were all just waiting for it just like they waited for insufficient value on the drabble cast <laughs> it was so, <laughs> you said it again it was so necessary to a show to the point where like every show had to have i think punky brewster had some kind of saying like that too that she would say in every show and it was ah, and they all cheer for it like you know, that's why they came there, so they could hear him say, What you talking about, Willis? Yeah, I don't know. It, it did eventually fade out, luckily. And that kind of crap was what the audience was there for, almost. Well, sure. that's that's a pretty dark period in our history, <laughs> I've mentioned before. But I wonder if future historians will look back on the snide remark before the opening titles on every episode of CSI and just shudder in the exact same way that I shudder when I think of up your nose with a rubber hose or uh, sit on it or <laughs> kiss my grits or they might. I've already seen comedians doing uh, routines that are based on the snide remark at the start of every <laughs> but, but yeah I think uh, definitely the snide remark thing all the different kind of uh, is tropes I hate that word tropes but I guess you could call it a trope you could call it a meme ooh a meme I much I like tropes meme. way more than memes oh I love meme the memes okay uh, that that are used in uh, various shows I think tropes is actually a more correct word though so we won't use meme how many CSIs are there I can't count that high I'm sorry there might be five now but uh, back when there were three, I worked on all three. Yeah? In the, in the in same, the same week? year. No, not the same week. <laughs> okay, yeah, that would have been a much better story. In the same I, day. I banged the PA on all three CSIs. And he was so good. <laughs> <laughs> have you ever watched any of those? Uh, I think I've seen one or two. I'm not really a fan of those kind of shows, though. Police procedurals. Yeah, my wife uh, likes them a lot, though. Not so much that she'll record them or anything, but... Uh, she used to read those, uh, what's her name? Patricia Cornwell. Yes. She used to read those Patricia Cornwell books back before the police procedurals, you know, became a thing. And I think most of those shows are based off of Patricia Cornwell stuff and other people that later copied Patricia Cornwell with her K. Scarpetta novels and stuff. And so she kind of has a built-in affinity for them already, so she'll watch them sometimes. But, you know, it's kind of hard sometimes to watch those shows with kids around because, you know, they show lots of gruesome dead bodies and stuff in those shows. Even though the kids are right there wandering around, you'll be seeing some baked person or something like that. And it can be pretty scarring. One time I remember... <laughs> My wife was up watching some show. I want to say it was ER or something like that, though. And uh, I think there was a baby that died on the show. And my son had snuck out of his room and it was, you know, peeking around the corner and trying to watch TV uh, instead of going to bed. And seeing this baby die on TV just traumatized the crap out of him. And he went into his room and was crying. My wife heard him. And she's like, what's going on? He's like, oh, the baby it died. It died. That was his first exposure to karmic retribution. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah, so we don't really see all that much of them. Are you a fan of those kind of shows? I like Castle, which is... I guess Castle is a police procedural. It's a slapstick version of those. No, I'm, I'm not. I don't watch any of them, sadly. Oh, yeah? You just um, act in them? <laughs> the one that my sister watches is the Law and Order Special Victims Unit. And, and it's just like, if I had to choose of all of those shows, which one I wouldn't want to watch, that's the one. It would be SVU. And, uh, oh, yeah, they probably don't even call it Special Victims Unit anymore. It's just like nobody calls M M Mickey D's McDonald's anymore. McShitholes? <laughs> <laughs> that was this episode, wasn't it? <laughs> that was, it was. Yeah, I wonder if there's a story there. 
There was a story, yes. It was called uh, Must Have Own Weapons. All right. Do you think that, that there are more stories in this series? I don't know. It would be cool if there was. This definitely seems like obviously the first where this guy meets up with the doctor and they become the active companions together. It seems like it could be difficult to carry on from there, but maybe not. You get the obvious introduction of these two characters. Maybe it would be interesting to see further adventures of these characters and see how they interact now that they're more familiar and stuff like that. I don't know. Well, if the professor had this experience and his mentor was killed or his love interest or, or, you know, we don't really know what the deal was, except she had an odd name. Do you think that, okay, he's not going to use the time machine anymore? It's like, you know, it's too dangerous. We almost winked out of existence because he was using the time machine. Or would they, would it call to you? Would I you think just it be would. like, oh, I, I, I just, just for a minute, I'm going to go and, and I'm yeah. going to watch. Yeah, I think he's one of those guys that wouldn't be able to let it go. I think there's a story in that, too, uh, uh, trying to get over the addiction of time travel. And it's calling to you and falling off the wagon. I think Rish is right. You've written time travel stories, right? I wrote at least one. One time we did it as a uh, broken mirror deal where we both decided to write a time travel story with a similar twist to it. And that was a fun uh, exercise. Yeah, it was. I, I really enjoy writing time travel stuff. Yeah, the hardest part about time travel is coming up with a good way for it to happen, I think. Because it's not, just, you know, the, the Doc Brown in the garage thing is only going to work uh, so often. You have to really have a certain type of a story for something like that. Otherwise, I don't know. I mean, how are you going to get somebody that can do time travel for a regular guy to go on the trip? I don't know. It's a tough thing to uh, work around. But, yeah, once you get going, it's fun stuff. Yeah. I don't know if, when what the last time travel movie was that came out. Well, there was uh, Time Traveler's Wife, not too long ago right. so you're thinking more like a big blockbuster kind no, of no i'm film. not just what was the last theatrically released time there was travel movie? hot tub time hot machine tub. good job that one came out after time traveler's wife yeah. right that was last year but usually there's one or every year maybe two because mm -hmm. you can go anywhere i mean the terminators are time travel movies right. back to the futures are time travel bill and ted are time travel movies you can make them broad comedies you can make them scary you can make them end of the world kind of thing yeah um, what was it called signal what was that one with dennis quaid in it frequency frequency does that count as a uh, time travel movie or no i would count it they talk over the radio through time <laughs> don't yeah. actually travel through time i don't think in the well point. There, there was that lake house story too where the mailbox oh, right. was three years or five years or something like that i think that's a time travel story the the sandra bullock premonition movie you wouldn't think would be a time travel movie but it jumped around in time and she was time traveling right what about that deja vu yeah movie? with denzel that's washington i think tony scott did that one too, that's a time right? travel flick so, yeah, you do get I, I I think if IMDb had a time travel link or whatever, we would find that there have probably been two a year for the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. You could say the butterfly effect is a time travel movie. Definitely is. And so, so you can do a bunch of different takes and stuff. It, we named three that we've done on our show, and we've been around for three years. I hope we do more than one a year. But now that we're putting out more episodes, I guess we can probably try and beat that record. We can do it. Ole. This, speaking of three, is Edward McKeown. <laughs> this is Edward McKeown's third story on the show. Yeah, we ought to have some kind of prize that we give to people when they get their third story on. But we didn't, so we're going to up it to five stories. <laughs> there you go. And uh, <laughs> I do hope that he shares something with us because the all three stories that he has submitted, uh, all, he may have submitted more, but all three stories that we've run, I think, are, are some of our best work. They really speak to me. And to what I like. And that's something that we talk about a lot. Why does Norm pick what he does on the Drabblecast? Why do the Escape Pod people pick the stories that they pick? And it probably just comes down to whoever is the editor likes certain things. Yeah. And, and they grab onto that. And this story has that. I hope that it's not political. And it's like, oh, if we have a story by so-and-so, more readers will come. Or if we have a story by an Asian woman, more, you know, we'll do this. Or, or somebody's got a book coming out, so we're going to do a short story by them. We've never done it that way, with one exception. Uh, listen to the last episode to find out what that was. There, there are certain things that I like. 
certain moods that I like, certain kinds of stories that I like. And he seems to know what that is. He sends these stories in and I've just really dug all three of them. And so thank you for again sending us another story that they knocked it out of the park. And thank you, Marshall Latham, for putting forth so much effort, you know, for to hear the dinosaur calls and the, yeah, the bird cool. sounds and stuff. I am I'm not sure. I, I I suppose he went to Free Sound and maybe there are a patasaur roars. <laughs> but I don't know. Yeah, I'm not sure where he came up with those, but they were very cool. Maybe he just went and then slowed it down or something. And that's possible, Pig. It's just, <laughs> uh, it's up to whoever produces a story, how they're going to do it. Yeah, I would be curious to know how he did the time travel sound and how he did a couple of the others. But uh, I'm glad that he did and that I didn't have to. The, the last story <laughs> that I edited took so long. I mean, not just hours, but we're talking weeks. And I mean, you do it all the time. So maybe you've gotten faster or, or whatever the deal is. It had been long enough that... That you'd gotten slower instead of faster. Well, right. Yeah. The, <laughs> it's like, okay, how do I edit in somebody else's voice? Oh, shoot. We're in stereo when they're in mono. What do I do? You know, it's just one of those things where I had to sort of reteach myself because it had been a long time. I, I really only edit my own stories on the, the air. To, uh -huh. And then, yeah, every once in a while I will take one, uh, but no more. <laughs> <laughs> Never again. Well, that's okay because we got a line of producers. Yes, we do. And the good thing about having a line of producers is they can take weeks to put it together because, you know, if you've got eight producers, then you've got eight weeks that you can get your stuff done. So that's cool. So, you know, if you're somebody who wants to be a producer, you want to knock it out of the park like Marsha Latham did, then uh, drop us a line because we'd love to have you. And let's work for you too. Have you found... That now when it's your turn to do a story, that it's more difficult than it used to be? Or it's like, oh, this is fun because I haven't had to do it every week for the past six weeks. Yeah, it is fun. It, it becomes less of a drudgery type thing and more of a fun thing. And I also find that sadly I put it off to the last minute uh, anyways. I think, oh, I don't need to do it right away. I've got eight weeks. And then, of course, the last week, I'm like, oh, crap, I've only got eight days. I better go. And now I've only got eight hours. There's that, too. But I'm really glad that we've got a bunch of folks helping out and we've really put together a good team because every one of our producers do a great job. Every week, I'm, I'm just jaw dropped open every time I hear uh, the stuff that they do. So it's really cool to have the folks uh, join in with us and have a, have a team going. Yes. So thank you. You know, Big, uh, something that... The listeners have mentioned lots of times, or, or they, they, they keep asking the same question, and it is, uh, what happened to your face? Um, and after I explain that sad story, uh -huh. they, uh, the other question that they ask is, hey, how come you guys don't have some kind of forum where we can comment on old episodes and bash you where, you know, as part of a group? instead of just the comments that you have at the bottom of every story? And uh, up till this point, I think our answer has been... I don't know. <laughs> no, but we didn't know how to make a forum. We did that episode where we talked about comments, and uh, several people suggested uh, to go along with the comments. Maybe we ought to have a forum if we really wanted to, people to be able to comment about stuff. Maybe we ought to give them a good place to do it. So, uh, and you know, that makes sense. It does. Because yeah. after a couple of weeks, or the, the story that you might want to comment on is way, way down there. It's not even on the main page. And nobody's going to see if you make a comment. Right. Uh, or ask some interesting question or make some kind of point that other people might want to respond to. Right. That, that kind of makes it uh, less likely that you want to do it. But, uh, yeah, so we decided. We, we decided we'd look into it. And I, and I looked up. And apparently there's ways to get these free. So it wouldn't be a, a, a big problem with the budget for the show. So I thought, eh, let's try it out. So I signed up for a free forum for the Dune Steve. And uh, yeah, so we've got it. It We're still trying to figure out how to set it up and make it work. Um, so, so there's a way to do it for free, but is there a way to do it where no effort is involved? <laughs> uh, there's not a way to do it where no effort is involved whatsoever, but it doesn't have to be our effort necessarily. That's what uh, we're, we're hoping. All these people who thought forums would be a good idea... Forums tend to need moderators, I guess, who are the people that go on there and, like, delete everybody's posts when they're, like, total jerks and stuff. You know, if if somebody were to comment, F you guys, 
and F Hervé Villachez, they could go in there and erase the Hervé Villachez part. Right. They could get rid of that stuff. They can, I don't know what they can do, but they're the cool people always on the side, I've noticed. The moderators are the ones that everybody thinks are cool. Because they have the power. They can yeah. change Hervé Villachez to Dakota Fanning. Mm-hmm. That's their, their strength. Line. That's right. So, yeah, I don't know if they're... The magic spell, I remember. Dr. Strange screwed up one time. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, we have uh, the, the form in there. It's, we'll, we'll put a button for it on the, on the website, too. But if you go to doonsteef.freeforums.org, then you can see the, uh, the forum that we've got set up. And, uh, yeah, you can uh, join up and post and all the uh, awesome threads that are going on here. And, uh, yeah, and if you're interested in being one of those totally cool, awesome moderators, um, you can let us know. And we will uh, most likely jump at the chance to take you up on the offer, I'm sure. Yeah, I, I think it would be great to have a forum and have people ask us questions and comment on, on old episodes and say, hey... Uh, what episode of all the ones you guys have done was the most work or, you know, whatever to answer those questions I'd love to do, Uh but to have to go on there and initiate the conversation, uh, pretty much the only question I'm willing to ask is who's your favorite ghostbuster. Okay. And so in fact, maybe we should go on there right now. That can be our very first, uh, our first, uh, what do you call it? Our first thread. Thread. There you go. Here, hold on one sec. In your fancy. All right, well, there All right, we go. There we go. It is now on there. Who's your favorite Ghostbuster? You know, people can give us suggestions of things that they'd like us to do in the the future. And, and, and people are listening to the show, to old shows, for the first time right now. And it may be that we mentioned that we were going to do something or I, we started to tell a story and got interrupted. Um, and we never, the, the other shoe never fell. And if somebody wants to mention that in the forums and say, hey, how come we never found out who killed Laura Palmer or whatever it is, they can mention it in the forums and and we can pick up on that and we can incorporate it into the podcast. Maybe you can suggest authors that you would like to hear stories from. I don't know. It's all in your hands now, folks. Yeah, the possibilities are nigh unto endless. I can't even imagine. I've been to other people's forums, and sometimes it's just mind-boggling how many thread. You know, it's like thread eight of eight hundred and seventy-one. You're just like, wow, all these different possibilities of conversation and and complaints, and you know, somebody wants to start a a Happy Feet Two thread. Mm -hmm. that, That I would be all for that. Yeah, could rant a little about that, I bet. So uh, that's, uh, again, doonsteef.freeforums.org. Ed will be putting a button on the uh, main side at doonsteef.com. Okay, and and let us know at editor at doonsteef.com if you want to be the person that puts the button on the snowman of life. <clears throat> I'm not really good at this, folks. Moderator. Maybe somewhere around episode 300 I will be able to... Uh, podcast correctly all right that's about it right that's pretty much it unless you got more to say well thank you for listening all the way to the end of the show uh once again we welcome your donations if you want to hear something out there beneath the pale moonlight someone's (laughs) thinking of me and loving me tonight by bd anklevich that's our incentive episode going right now that's right it's available it's a long title i I should have asked you to truncate maybe i'll shorten it maybe we'll just shorten it down to something a little less but uh If you donate to the show or sign up for a uh, quarterly or monthly donation, what do they call that? A subscription to the show? Yeah, I think they do. Then we will send you that episode, the bonus episode that we did. And uh, we will also send you you our thanks. And we'll let you pull our fingers if you want. No, you you fart enough, sir. (laughs) This episode has been filled to the brim. Uh, (laughs) But that money that comes in from donations we use to pay writers like Edward and host our server fees and just to pay for the damn domain name. (laughs) And so we appreciate and we need those donations. Thank you if you have donated. Damn you if you haven't. No, I can't go that far. Thank you if you have donated. Consider it if you haven't. (laughs) How's that? I think that works. All right. Let's let people go their way. But we will see you in the future. Yes. In the future. 
bring your own weapons. See you, folks. Looks like we're out of time. The Dune Steef is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license, meaning share it with everyone, but don't sell it or change it. Take two. What's our story tonight? Today's story is web. Well, what is it? <laughs> web. Uh, you would ask that when I don't have it up to read. Well, get it up. That's what she said. And you were unable to comply. There we are. Hello. Spider Bunt. <laughs> Must have own weapons by Edward Mc. What did we ever McEwen? Mc- McEwen is how I said it, and I and I guess that's still not right. <sighs> I say to you, Edward, okay. what do you have to say back? That was very nice. I have nothing to say. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I guess that's what I have to say back. That's not bad, actually. <laughs> you know, you're upset. You're bored. You're depressed because there's nothing going on. Your woman's left you. I call her Vera. 7-8-2-5-1-6-2-3-9. Is that okay? Yes. See, that I sounds can... delightfully gay. <laughs> you know me so well. It would be okay on any other day. My fine young son has turned out gay. That's so My cool. teenage daughter ran away. Can't think of any more lines to go with that. My wife is proud to tell me of her, her love, love affairs. affairs. How could she do this to me? My wife has burned the scrambled Tumbled eggs. My, te- my dog just bit, bit my leg. leg. My teenage daughter ran away. My, my fine young son has turned, turned out gay. gay. And it would be okay. That's On any a Stuart song, day. isn't it? No, 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 no. Yeah. He does most of the lyrics to it, too. <laughs> There's a house about on my street. And it, it looks, looks real neat. neat. I'm the chap who lives in it. All right, sorry. Whoever's editing. Who is editing this? I think it may be Marshall. Oh, poor Marshall. Marshall, Marshall, Marshall. You're always taking his side. Gosh. Because he did anachronosis and it kicked yeah. ass. Sorry, yeah. but uh, Marshall. Kicked buttocks. It kicked both buttocks. Yeah. A foot to each Mormons buttock. Mormons don't have buttocks. I read that in a book. Really? Really. Wow. On any other day. Okay. <laughs> Poor guy. Swig it. I need a, a bottle of some sort. Here, have some fabuloso. <laughs> oh, it's actually good. That was so funny and anachronosis. The you, uh, my drinking and I go. Whoa. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> drinking funny liquids. <laughs> Multi colorful liquids. This is colorful liquids. <laughs> you sound like I'm a thinking. friggin' Buffalo Bill guy in Silence of the Lambs. <laughs> <laughs> it puts the lotion on its skin, or else it gets the hose again. Okay, you're going to definitely have to edit this. Marshall will never work for us again if he hears what we're really oh, like. Oh, he will, and he will like it. Okay. Straight there it is on me. any other day. <laughs> no, I'm down to here, though. Oh, oh, gosh, you're right. It says it again. Am I going to be able to get through it without bursting into song? It's not a good song, though. Oh, I love that song. How? I just do. It's one of those really uh, quirky... I don't like any of the Stewart songs, I don't think. Do you, th- do you think Stewart did... Uh, he had to do um, Be My Girl Sally, too, right? I love Be My Girl Sally. But the goofy... Andy reads, Does sings he? it, or performs it. So you think it's an Andy song? Does he? Did he write anything? I think there was a song that Andy wrote, but... Really? Yeah, the, there, but... Like on every album, there would be a Stewart song. Yeah, Stewart's got some songs that are pretty but terrible. I think Andy has only one. Song. On any other day is definitely one of the better Stewart songs. I don't know. It's we may a have lot to... better than like I like to eat my friends or make no bones about it. It's so much better than that. Song. Um, 
We'll have to listen to it and make Marsha listen to it. Yes. We're going to play it right now. Put the mic to the computer and make you listen. He's along for the ride. You know, he's just, he's being yeah. puppeteered by us and he has That's to. That's right. He's chained to, uh, to our rear view mirror and he's going wherever we drive. One of those darn things where it's like 26 minutes of outtakes and they haven't started the story yet. Come well, on, we're on paragraph two. Are we? <laughs> yeah, on any other day. <clears throat> see if I can stop smiling for a second and get back into character. I looked over at the 357 revolver I bought for my job in the... And... <clears throat> scrolled down earlier. Uh, slur it a little bit. Uh, Are you uh, drunk, sir? Yes, sorry about the burp. I can't help it. I humped the kit down to my old Saturn, then grabbed a cup of coffee and an egg biscuit from Mick Shitholes, and drove out to Boston. Out of Boston. Darn. Somebody's going to say, why aren't you talking like some Bostoners in this? <laughs> oh, geez. Do we have to? Yeah, do you remember the dude who complained that my... Oh, uh, totally do. Yeah. My... That guy's dead now. Good. Yeah, you probably... It cost all my mom's frequent flyer miles <laughs> to get me over there. But at least it wasn't in my name. Uh, uh, I just realized Marshall has to hear the milches, too. Yeah. It's his favorite part I've heard from... Oh, good, good. Around, you know, some people have told me. A handsome, older woman with red hair and a bun eyed me with a guarded expression. I wanted to say guarded. What is my problem? Hand- Maybe a Bostonian would say guarded. <laughs> Maybe they would. Maybe that was what it was. I was just getting into the character. Walk-in fireplace and a heavy leather fr- Darn. Why would there be a walk-in fireplace? What would be the purpose of that? You can just get in there Entrance and burn. to the bat cave? <laughs> and burn yourself? Need a walk-in fireplace so I can store all my wood in the back. He carried in a tray. Oh, okay. <laughs> I thought they were saying that he carried something in the tray. But no, he carried the tray in. Ah. <laughs> he carried in a tray with coffee and mixings and put it down on the campaign table. What the deuce is a campaign table, sir? One that you take on a campaign. Is a guy going to jump out with a camera? Only if you tell me you're here to molest young boys. Well, of course. Isn't that normal? Do you seem like a guy that's into that? (laughs) You have. No idea? Ah, you've read my mind. (laughs) Weatherby Grand Safari. One must have the right tools. Now take off your pants. Uh, I've got a 357 here. I will shoot you. Oh, well. The professor went up to the walk-in fireplace and studied a curious instrument that looked like an astrolabe. Astrolabe? Let's just see what the freak an astrolabe is. What the deuce is an astrolabe? Marshall, come find out what an astrolabe is with us. Deuced inconvenient thing. This probably isn't going to be Marshall at all that edits this. And be like, who, why, who, Stop is there calling someone me in Marshall. the room called Marshall? Is, is Big's name Marshall? What is, uh, is, is, is Big in law enforcement? Astrolabe. 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 <laughs> An awesome echo. An astronomical instrument for taking the altitude of the sun. Or stars for the solution of other problems in astronomy and navigation. Shut your pie hole, or else. It looked at the apatos- apatosaurs. Say apatosaur. I wish we could just change it to brontosaurus. I hate people that say apatosaurus. It's been brontosaurus for a hundred years, and then in like 1976, somebody said, "No, that's not a correct term. That's 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 slang or something." Yeah. And, and so the, it's the same animal? It's the same animal, yeah. This is oh. the technical term, and people call them brontosaurus. I just assumed it was a similar but slightly different animal. Because they have, you know, a gazillion things that are just like a tyrannosaurus, for example, but are slightly shorter or taller or have a third nipple or something. <laughs> Change the riverbed. Just around the river bend. Thing I like best about rivers is you never step in the same river twice. 
The water's always moving, always flowing. The hell is announcer man when we need him? <laughs> In a few minutes, he was satisfied. Follow me. If you want to live. I guess we should have got the Rand McNally. You say McNally or McAnally? McNally. Okay. McShit. Oh. <laughs> I levered around into the 50... You did what? Flowers to place on the cairn, right? That's how I'd say it. Do you want to check? It's actually Kairin. <laughs> okay, never mind. Good point. What else could it be? I don't know. <laughs> I'm sure there could be something. Cairn. Dictionary.com says... Astrolabe. Cairn. <laughs> also, Karn. Well, that, that goes, took a long time. It has gotten really bad. Now you know why I must remove it. He suggests if you remove the boat, he might be able to play the back the whole, the entire message. I can't do it. You blew it. I had the chance to be a real C3 peel. <laughs> you blew it. I hung back as the professor sat. Okay, I- promise me if you ever meet Robert De Niro before the show is over that you will have him say you had the chance to be a real podcaster and you blew it. Okay, I promise. You know how cool that would be? (laughs) Yeah, I guess. But is there ever going to ever, ever in a million years be a chance that I meet Robert De Niro with recording equipment? Okay, good point. But (laughs) cast shape change on Duquesne. What form do you choose for him? Fat. (laughs) That brings me such joy that we use that (laughs) twice. Twice in a row. Don't you love that, though? He goes, fat. The episode was so amazingly good. <laughs> I waved. Chandler. Oh. <laughs> I waved. Chandler up. The stink of blood. Hung, Hung in, the in the air. Something dog-like. Spock. <laughs> Chandler looked up at the lowering clouds in the wet. Chandler looked up at the lowering crowd. Crowds. Was I actually back 50,000 years in a European forest listening to the yowls of God knew what in the hills? Can you imagine how the sky would have looked back then? You know, they said that before the Industrial Revolution, you could see Mars and Venus during the day like you can see the moon during the day now. Really? The skies were so clear. Huh. Let's see if he comes into the light. Extra apostrophe. Or er, quote mark. Those aren't apostrophes. Are they? Quote marks. Quotes. Do they call? Do they have a special name? I think so. I don't know. Let's be, be, be quiet. We don't want this guy <laughs> here stocking up a punctuation. The creature moving down the draw was a Neanderthal. I always say Neanderthal That's myself. That's how we say it. So I should say Neanderthal, but you say Neanderthal because you're Chandler. Right. Chandler Bing. I love Chandler Bing. <laughs> what became of that guy? He made it to 30 years old and then became 13. Wait, no, that was the other show. He was 16 again? What was his? I think it was 17. Again. 17 again? I'm sure I don't know. I'm sure you saw it 10 times. I never saw it even five times with my pants around my ankles. I mean, at all. Uh, Anti. Uh, oh. Uh, uh, he said. That's a strange sound, huh? Because you don't have trees. Huh? I don't know. I mean, we have small trees. I saw one one night last summer. Flying, uh, flying home from your house. Driving home from your house. And it was like this friggin' big. You know, it flew, and I was just like, holy crap, that was an owl! Yeah, I've never noticed, I guess probably because they're nocturnal, I don't see them much. Lots of hawks out here, though, like crazy, man. We saw one just the other day, it was building a nest, we were driving down, and it went flying, and for a second I thought it was like a falcon that had one of those things tied around its ankles so that it could land on somebody's arm, because it had something dangling off of it. I was like, hey, look, it's a falcon. And then we got closer and I was like, oh. Let me guess. It was a baby's arm. <laughs> it had a giant branch in its, in its. I guess it must have been in its beak. Or maybe it was in its talons. I don't know what, what it had grabbed it with. I can't remember to tell you the truth. But yeah, I was just like, whoa. 
Must be making a nest, I guess. That's cool. How about you? What do you have in Idaho, Marshall? Marshall, Marshall, Marshall. You're always asking Marshalls. To, uh, gosh. See, I don't know Idaho. Do you have frogs in Idaho? I love frogs more than life itself. Yes, Rish. We have many birds here in Idaho. We have hawks and owls and robins and sparrows and many others. The Idaho state bird is the mountain bluebird. It is really quite pretty. Oh, and eagles. Yes, we have eagles. At least up here in North Idaho in the Panhandle. South and East Idaho is pretty much all desert with sagebrush and stuff. But the eagles are nice. If you go out by Lake Coeur d'Alene in December and January, you can see quite a few eagles. I know Idaho has frogs too, but I don't know how many different varieties. And that's that's yeah, that's Idaho. Okay, moving on. Our rifles crack together. I can't say cracked together. It's the t, -t sound going at the same time. You did it at least once, though. Mm. Many times you've read that sentence. Cracked together, cracked together. No! <laughs> Our rifles cracked together. My rifle clicked empty. I whipped out the pistol and... The pistol. Ew. I scanned with my field glasses for a few minutes before turning to Chandler. Where is Monica? I demanded. Still hot. Surely he can't get them all. He can use time effectively. And don't call me Shirley. <laughs> and for Satara. Oh, her again. You have no idea what her buttocks were. Sorry, Marshal. Hours later, we left the shade of the forest into a glacial moraine. It's got to be moraine, right? I don't think there's any other way you'd say it. The name of a character on uh, Wheel of Time. Really? Although I think she's got a M O I, it's like Moraine. Moraine, it looks like, so we would have gotten it wrong. Damn. Moraine. Moraine. A ridge, mound, or irregular mass of unstratified glacial drift. Chiefly boulders, gravels, sand, and clay. Why does any person know that word? And why did dictionary.com get that poor woman to say that word? For this exact moment. All our lives have been building up to this moment. Moraine. Okay, am I the Neanderthal? Yeah. In the, in the two person version, be, I was yes. going to be, but. We can get somebody else. Marshall, Marshall, Marshall could be the Neanderthal if he wants to. Does he speak English? He speaks English, but the problem is he speaks with no known in uh, accent. So I was just going to make one up. I was kind of looking forward okay. to it. Well, but, then do it. But I. Do <clears throat> Put down your foot. Stop letting Marshall push you around. Well, Marshall deserves to be able to do something. I mean, after, after all, he got hit in the face with that football that one time. Oh, wait. O'Doyle rules. He'll never be a teen model now. <laughs> <laughs> See, I thought you didn't get it. That's great. <laughs> the body armor beneath my jacket stopped the machete from penetrating. She said. I learned it that my people were doomed until the main time river could be altered. Unless. <laughs> I'm sorry. I had to try, but there's way too many EDs in there. Will we meet again, Professor? Chandler looked at me over his glasses. I'm sure we will, young man. I'm sure we will. In time. The door slid smoothly closed. And welcome back. Hope you enjoyed that little episode. I'm sure many of you won't consider that fantasy. And there'll be a whole bunch of people in the forums complaining about how it was sci-fi. Get used to it. We play what we like. Stay. Bark, bark, wagtail. Good boy. Good boy.